Two weeks ago, we began this series by looking first at the narthex, the way in and the way out, the way into the sanctuary, the way into church, and the way out into the world. And we noted that it's more than just a lobby at a theater or an opera or a symphony hall or a concession section of a great stadium. In fact, to, today I want to suggest that the narthex is like backstage where we all wait to come out and play our parts in this great drama of salvation history, the drama God calls us to play every time we worship. And then it's also backstage for the drama we will play out in the world, as Shakespeare said, all the worlds, a stage where God is calling on us to participate in God's redemption of the world. It's part of our strategic plan, our mission, joining God in the world. And last week, we noted that there are many who are watching how we play our part in this drama. Uh, the world is watching. God is watching. The great cloud of witnesses are all watching how we participate in this great drama of salvation history. Today, we look at the lectern and the Bible. The Bible, like the narthex, is also a way in and a way out. If the narthex is the way in to the church and the worship service and the way out in the, to the world, the Bible is our way into God's story. And it's a beautiful story in itself. The Bible is held by the lectern which is a little bit like a conductor's stand before a symphony or an opera or a choral performance, or an orator's podium in ancient Athens, or the bema, B-E-M-A, that held the Torah in the synagogue. In our own Presbyterian tradition, we find in our roots in the Church of Scotland, there was a person who was called the Beadle, B-E-A-D-L-E, who carried the Bible in in a very ceremonious way at the beginning of the service, placed it on the lectern, and then it was carried back out. Because Bibles like the Torah are, are rare, and one needed to protect both from thievery or damage of any kind. So today we look at the lectern and the Bible, spending most of the time on the Bible, because how much can you say about a lectern? The Bible is the key to this series of sanctuary symbols. Like the narthex, it is a way in and a way out. It is the way into God's story, and that is also our story. It is the kingdom story, just as the Dutch pastor on our Holy Land trip a few years ago said to us as the rays of the Israeli sunlight danced about on the fields. He said, for Israelis and for Christians, history is not just a sum of the past. It is living history. For when we tell how Moses brought Easter to Egypt, we also are delivered. We are Abraham and Sarah. We are Adam and Eve. We are playing the same roles as the biblical characters. And when we play these roles in the drama of salvation history, what is the script for our play but the Bible? The script for our play that God calls on us to participate in is the scripture itself. And so, week after week, we rehearse our parts in this great drama of salvation history so that we can participate in it out there in the world. So we make our way from the narthex down the aisle into the sanctuary, but we also make our way up to the Bible, which is a profound document. Five or six billion of them sold in history, the best-selling book in all of history. And the Bible is what gives us entry into that swashbuckling world of battles and beasts, of floods and miracles, of triumphs and defeats. And 
we need to understand that it has shaped our civilization. It is recognized by all, whether Christian or Jew or what. Milton wrote long ago, there are no songs comparable to the songs of Zion. There are no orations equal to those of the prophets, no politics like what the scriptures tell us. Think of the intrigue that swirls about David and Solomon and all the judges and the kings. Even the most convinced atheist cannot un overlook the power of the Bible, cannot overlook the richness of the literature here. And it's not just rich, rich, richness of literature for the educated and the refined. It's not just for the intellectual. It is not just for those who are elite. No, the richness of the literature here is for everyone. The Bible, said Gregory the Great, is a running stream that an elephant can swim in, but a lamb can also participate in without losing its feet. It is so deep that theologians can't even get to the bottom of it, and yet babes cannot drown. Theodore Parker put it this way, the Bible can go equally to the, the cottage of a peasant, and to the palace of a king. And it is woven throughout our literature. All English professors will tell you this. It colors the talk of our streets and even today, the internet. And we hear it all kinds of places, surprising places. 39 years ago, when our older son Jeremy was born, I was just coming to the end of teaching my first Greek class at Union Seminary back in 1977. And I remember going in where Jane was about to deliver Jeremy and we were at Medical College of Virginia, MCV Hospital. And uh, it was a teaching hospital, so it still is. So there were interns and, and uh, nurses and residents, all kinds of, it was a full room. And we all had our masks and we're doing breathing and come on Jane, let's go. And at some point when Jeremy didn't quite come out yet, the doctor leaned forward and he said, well, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a professor at the Union Seminary. Well, what do you teach? Well, I teach New Testament Greek right now. And he said, oh, well, what do you think's a good translation of the Bible? I don't know, the New English Bible. My wife's having a baby. And you want to talk about the Bible? And other people started saying, well, I like such and such translation. And I like so and so. And somebody said, well, I like J.B. Phillips. And Jane said, excuse me, but mm, and Jeremy came out right at that moment. We almost named him J.B. Now, I was stunned that this many, these, that, that many people wanted to talk about the Bible. You see, the Bible influences everyone, and it is recognized by everyone for its usefulness. And yet, when we open it and begin to read it seriously, we need to ask ourselves, do we really want to go where it takes us? It may take us to surprising places where we don't want to go. For one thing, it not only looks dull, you know, dressed in undertaker's black, like our Bible here, it actually is dull in some places. Read your way through the, the uh, sacrifices in Leviticus and the dietary laws. Well, I mean, I could almost put God to sleep. Some of it is, is hard reading, uh, you know, there are all these other parts that are, the, the prophets are horrendously redundant. And like some preachers, they never know when to stop, you know? And the begats, so-and-so begats, so-and-so, that's a real cure for insomnia. I mean, there are places in Exodus passages that old Moses must have nodded over. But, you know, the Bible, in addition to being boring in some places, in an age of entertainment, has actually turned some people off with its fanatical nationalism, especially in the Old Testament. Those you know, well, let's go out and kick some you know what for God passages. There are those in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament that turned some Christians into warriors for Jesus. It probably spurred some of the Crusades and the Inquisition. And we, we don't know what to do with those parts. 
we don't feel comfortable with them. Bigner says some people are turned off by the Bible because it really is a swarming compost of a book, you know, with poetry and, and, and propaganda and history and hysteria. There's all this stuff in there that we don't know what to do with. So when we say we want to enter the world of the Bible, we need to ask ourselves, are we really ready to enter this world? Because this world calls our very lives into question. We know anytime we read a book, it changes us. It just does. It happens when you read a book. And the scary thing is when you read the Bible, it can really change you. It can really call your life into question. Oh, we want to read the Bible like any other book, but it's not any other book. To read the Bible as literature only would be like reading Moby Dick as a whaler's manual or Brothers Karamazov just for its punctuation. Like the Divine Comedy, Don Quixote, Paradise Lost, the Bible hangs heavy on many a conscience. Perhaps there should be some signs hanging around it. You know, bright yellow signs that say something like caution. The Surgeon General advises be careful about reading this Bible. It may be hazardous to your way of life, especially if you're leading a life steeped in sin. No, the Bible calls all our lives into question. Some of us want to bend it to fit our lives, but the Bible doesn't like to bend a lot. Uh, you know, we, we want to turn the Ten Commandments into the Ten Suggestions, and it never will let us, right? I mean, the Bible is the anvil upon which many an arrogant spirit has been broken. That's the story that Stephen Covey loves to tell, and I'm sure you've heard of, of the dark and stormy night and officers on the bridge, and he says to the captain, Captain, there's a light in our sea lane. And it won't move over. And the captain says, well, tell us, tell them starboard. And so the signal goes out, starboard, starboard. And the signal comes back, starboard yourself. And, and the captain says, I can't believe this. Tell them who we are. So the signal goes out, this is the mighty Missouri, turn aside. The signal comes back, this is the lighthouse, turn aside yourself. <laughs> See, cities fall. Empires crumble. And they have. Civilizations that we know in, in, in ancient history are gone. And kingdoms fade away. But the word of God will endure forever. The grass withers and the flower fades, says the uh, prophet Isaiah. But the word of God will endure forever. Long after we and this old church are long gone, the word of God will endure forever. So we have to ask ourselves, are we ready to enter this world that calls our lives into question? Or do we want to treat it, you know, let's just do a scholarly analysis of it. You know, be like a tourist, you know, walking up and down its streets and glancing at its wares. That's what can happen if you just get too focused on biblical languages or theology and forget that this is really a message of the living God to you and me. Sometimes we are like the teenage boy who loved astronomy and his father bought him a telescope and he, he loved studying optics and he loved taking it apart and examining the lenses and the distance. And, but he never stopped and looked at the stars. He never stopped and examined the wonders of heaven. There are people who can recite you chapter and verse, but they've never experienced the grace of God that comes through this wonderful, good, wonderful book. Mortimer Adler has a great book. If you've never read it, I want to strongly encourage you. It's called How to Read a Book. In fact, I recommend it to all high school students, all college students, how to read a book. And one of the big points he makes is that we should read books like a love letter. Do you remember how you read a love letter? I remember love letters Jane sent me 45, 46 years ago. 
You read every line of it. You read between the lines. You read in the margins. You read it for all you can because you want to know what that other person is really saying to you and you feel something for that other person. Well, I tell you today that the Bible is a love letter from God to you and me. It is the letter from the eternal lover of our souls that loves you more than you could ever imagine. I know some of you come in not feeling very loved sometimes. But know this today, that if you enter the world of the Bible, if you read it like a love letter, then you will hear the message of God that you have never heard before. You will find yourself now in the very heart of God, in the mind of Christ, and you will feel the power of the Holy Spirit. So, you see... The lectern and the Bible may be two of the most important sanctuary symbols that we will ever know because they point to the God we love and the God we worship. To this God, be all honor and worship and glory and praise from this day forth and forevermore. God bless you all.